Hi, and welcome to another episode of King Crush Thursdays, the series where we highlight and uplift Black men, because frankly, not too many people are doing it. My name is Val Gay, and I am so thrilled to bring to you yet another amazing king. His name is Sekou Campbell. He is a husband, a father, um, a lawyer, but also a theater artist, um, an artist and a lawyer using both sides of the brains. Um, he's a mentor, he's a coach, he volunteers, he's he's an all around um, great guy. And I know that you're gonna enjoy getting to know him as much as I have. So please welcome Sekou. Hey, hey Sekou. Hi, Val, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, I'm gonna send you an intro to my parents. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I should have said son, and he's a son. And son. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, they've done a great job, so you should definitely, I should have <laughs> That's fine. My, my, my mom just did a podcast on parenting, so. Oh, nice. Last month, so I will. Awesome, <laughs> awesome, awesome. I'll let awesome. her know that someone thinks she did a good job. Yes, yes, she absolutely <laughs> did. She absolutely did. That's awesome. Excellent. Well, thank you. As you know, we ask the same six questions to all of our kings because our goal is to create a repository of questions and answers that will hopefully shine a light on, um, frankly, a mythical character called the positive Black man, right? Um, and, and the idea is if there's a young king out there who doesn't have a positive male role model in his life, that he could come to this repository and see these same six questions, but hear so many different answers from the mirror things that we are community. And then similarly, if there is a young king like your son who has amazing, positive, and successful Black men in his life, he too could still come and learn something from the broader community. And then finally, for the rest of us who are neither male or even Black in some cases, um, that we too can learn more about um, the people that are all around us, but often go, in my estimation, um, unnoticed unnecessarily. So, um, so I'm so glad that you're here to participate and to contribute to this repository. And I'm just gonna get started with question number one, which is, what does manhood mean to you? Manhood, uh, I would describe manhood um, I suppose as, as personhood, most importantly. Um, and so recognizing the humanity in, in every person and investing in, in every person um, as best you can. Um, you know, there's clearly, you, one must be judicious with their time. Uh, and so you can't necessarily invest everything into everyone, but acknowledging at the very minimum the humanity in every person that you come in contact with um, and trying to impart that to to those who are closest around you uh, for me that's you know you mentioned fatherhood that's part, part the, the my chief uh, job as a man uh, is being a father and imparting that principle into my children um, I have three um and and then i think sort of parallel to that no less um certainly um is is my partner my my wife um and being um a, a, a an important um, sounding board an important um um source of reliance for for my wife um both you know, physically and and mentally and emotionally. Um, so not merely simply being the quote unquote provider, although I think that's very important, but also being, um, you know, emotionally available and vulnerable. Um, so I, I think, you know, when I, when I think about, um, you know, that idea of, of acknowledging and investing in humanity, I think a lot of it comes from uh, our ability to be vulnerable um, to with ourselves and with those who are closest to us. Um, and paradoxically, I think that demonstrates strength. And so in order to sort of develop 
the the strength the i'm really on this new word anti-fragility so not mere, merely strength or resilience but actually being able to take in um what ostensibly feels like harm and creating a good out of that harm um the best analogy that i've read is is like a muscle right so you work out a muscle it you're doing damage to that muscle but as a result of that damage the muscle gets stronger and so i think our lives should be led in that way um and i think that's you know a critical component of manhood but that's a that's a complicated tough way i could probably talk for an hour just about that question <laughs> so <laughs> i'll stop there <laughs> Okay, well, and, that, and that's a great answer, um, and I really appreciate it. And you went into so many different areas, um, and one of the areas that you kind of touched on, um, and I'd like you to elaborate on, is who and or what is important to you. Um, so I, I really like the idea of these five concentric circles that I, that I use um, to to illustrate this point. So. Um, it comes from something else, but I, I feel like in terms of identifying things that are important, I, I, I really love it. So I start with psychology. So myself, my own, my own well-being, my mentally, you know, physically, spiritually, <clears throat> um, starting there. Because if I'm, if if that's not important, I can't give anything to anyone else. Um, so I've got to take care of myself first. And we often, I think, well, at least I have oftentimes strayed from that. Um, I think, you know, in in your, in the nonprofit world, and I think I've been in the nonprofit world for, for, for many years, um, although technically not officially in the nonprofit world now. Um, and there's this, this, this compelling need to want to give, and we often neglect that psychology and, and particularly now during the COVID crisis, I've, I've come to realize how important it is to, to make yourself a priority, no matter, no matter what, even though you have all these other responsibilities. So psycho psychological. Next is personal. So my family, those who are and, and close friends, but really my family, for me, it's my family. It's about what all that time I have with three kids, a wife and, you know, countless nephews and um, and I have no nieces. I, 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 my daughter is the only female in my family that hasn't married in, um, and brothers and parents and all that. So really, it's it's my, my that my family uh, for the most part, and my neighbors actually, who are in my personal circle, who I, I would deem to be a, a priority for me. Um, the next is professional, right? So my job um, and. Um, I've kind of gone through an evolution, um, as you noted. I was, you know, I started my education. I got an, a theater degree right right after college, um, and I was a teacher and theater professional for many years. And then I went to law school, and now I'm a lawyer. But at the core of all of those jobs is this, is again going back to this notion of investment and really trying to find. Um, ventures that I can invest in that make the world a better place, that make the community better. Um, primarily that's through the arts, um, but I also work, as you know, with a number of nonprofit organizations and 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 for-profit organizations that have that do some social good. Um, so that, you know th those are the things that are important to me professionally and so I make that a priority. Um, political um, and politically not not merely sort of I would characterize as capital P politics, like we're about to go vote or why well, actually I, I voted already, but the the end of the voting season will come soon. Um, and that's important, but also um, you know, thinking about values and community and civics and you know, I, to me politics comes down to things like, you know, the way the trash is picked up, you know, being involved with um, you know, talking to folks in the neighborhood about our parks and, and our green spaces and, and all of those things, not, not merely just, you know, the sort of large ideological issues, but um, down to kind of the nitty gritty stuff. 
Um, and then ph philosoph philosophical. Um, so for me, that's, you know, spiritual. Um, um, again, through the COVID crisis, I think we probably, you know, it's very Shakespearean. It comes from Shakespeare. That's, that's these five circles come from. They're actually an Elizabethan construct. But the, the philosophical, you know, in some ways ties all the way back to the psychological. So there's this spiritual thing. And again, during COVID, I did discovered actually that Philadelphia has amazing parks <laughs> and started to sort of develop a different relationship with nature um, and, and thinking about, you know, what is important. Um, I think it, you can probably tell from my answers, a lot of my life, a lot of the way that I live is, is focused on really trying to live a sort of fair principled life um, and not so much about sort of material things um, or status or things like that. I'm, you know, more focused on, you know, like Martin Luther King said, you know, when I die, I want people to talk about the fact that I helped someone, not, you know, not, you know, any, any award or special or a big house or nice car or anything like that. Things that die when you die, um, but rather things that can live long past, you know, all of us. That's awesome. That, that's an amazing answer. Thank you so much. Yeah, I love that quote from Dr. Kings. Um, so, uh, so how do you want us to see you? Uh, well, like I said, I, I just want to be known as somebody who helped, as somebody who um, cared, cared enough and was fair. I think fairness too is, is really important to me. Um, I learned, I, you know, we all have, I, you know, this idealistic, goals when we're when we're young um and i learned very quickly that the law is not necessarily um a form for fairness <laughs> um but it is a tool that we can use to make the world more fair um and that's how i've chosen to to lead my 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 legal career um there's a a, a well-known quote from charles hamilton houston who's one of the early deans if not the first dean of, of howard law school howard university law school um, who said, you know, there are two types of lawyers. There are, there are those who are parasites and those who are social engineers. Um, and you have to choose whether you're, you know, a parasite or, or a social engineer. And I I'm, I'm, would like to be known as a social engineer. <laughs> I don't know if I am, wow. but I would like to be known as that. <laughs> and I think that that's, that's actually something that all of us should should consider like how we are in the world. Are, are we going to be parasitic or are we going to actually create a new world or a better world? Um, that's amazing. I'm going to keep that one with me. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so thank you. What is your epic dream? Whoa, epic dream. <laughs> all right. I just talked about all this non-material stuff, but I, I, the first thing that came to mind, because we just had this conversation, is the only luxury item I want is like one of those fancy coffee machines, you know, where they, where it's like hooked up to a, I'm a coffee nut. So that's, that's like a silly epic dream that I have. But truly, I think, you know, where I am now in terms of my work and everything, what I'm starting to see and I'm really hopeful about, and so right now it's an epic dream, is to see, um, more stories, more widely distributed that center on people of color. Um, um, you know, I'm black and so I'm certainly biased towards black stories, but um, you know, I think of, for example, Lovecraft Country um, and, you know, I put off watching it for a while and the story is amazing and, it, and it's fun and entertaining and all of that, but what really, you know, sort of makes me, fulfills me about that story is that it, it so seamlessly centered on people of color and, and shows how we're all so well, so connected um, and the effect of colonialism on all of us, right? Whether you're, um, so Lovecraft Country follows, you know, centers on <clears throat> um, three or four um, Black people in the 50s um and 
uh, one of them is a Korean War veteran. So there's 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 this um, there's a storyline that involves Asian people, uh, or Korean specifically, um, although they deal with other topics, their relationship to Japan and and what and whatnot. But um, there's that, and it's very centered in, in in that story and what what happened to people in Korea, not what the U.S. did in Korea. Um, and of course, with Black people focusing on on us and not just what white people did to us, although again, that's all there. Um, and that's, that, that is really cool. And I've been working on a number of other um, um, deals in, um, with film and TV specifically um, and books um, that deal, that, that are similarly centered on um, BIPOC individuals. And so I think that's really, um, that's really fulfilling. And so I guess, you know, an epic dream for me would be to see, you know, more of that, um, you know, something, um, you know, even more substantial and, and a much more equitable telling of our story. Um, and I, for me, just to explain that a little bit, for me, um, I, I find it so important because com sometimes people say, oh, well, you know, it's just something that we do to kind of distract ourselves. And that's true. But the other part of the narrative is that, and, and I thought the beautiful, the film that displayed this beautifully was Black Klansman, mm -hmm. is that our narrative, it, it drives what happens to our people, right? So we're talking, you know, people are in the streets about Black Lives Matter and stuff. That, the behavior of the police that people are protesting stems all the way back to birth of a nation. Um, uh, not the not the new one, the, the old one, um, and Gone with the Wind, and those those were like the original Hollywood blockbusters, and and those tropes still exist today in the minds of many, um, and those narratives still get told even on the daily on the nightly news, um, and so, you know, there's a lot of work to be done to push back that narrative that I think will have ripple effects throughout throughout our society. So I'm, that's my epic dream is for that to, for the for the rock to be dropped and for those ripple effects to be felt. That's powerful. That is really powerful. Excellent. Thank you. When we need so many of our stories to be told in so many different ways, I think we need a, a wholesale shifting of the narrative, Absolutely. which is partially um, why this even this platform exists for me. That like the narrative has to be shifted and. I can't shift everybody's narrative, but I got to, at least in my little sphere, how can we, <laughs> you know, shine a different light, right, you know, right. you're tired of the same old thing that, you know, is just a microcosm of, of the full narrative. And even that microcosm is negatively skewed um, right. and not properly and not often properly um, portrayed. Right. Um, so I'm grateful. I'm, I'm, I'm rooting for you on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, Seiko, you've told us so much already, and I think we're really getting um, a good sense of this, but who are you? Who am I? Um, Seiko Campbell. <laughs> um, who am I? Um, so, I guess I could say, um, there's certain, the, the things that I use to identify myself, I think um, I've been really thinking a lot about geography. And so I, one of the things that I, is critical to my identity is the fact that I'm a Harlem native. Um, uh, you know, I, I really believe that I see the world through, through that lens. Um, Another big aspect of my identity, as I've been saying, is 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 as a father and as a husband, um, as as a black man, um, and you know, uh, not quite on that tier, but still, you know, certainly a part of my identity is being a lawyer. Um, uh, you know, because I didn't start as a right out of college as a lawyer it's not i don't think it's as prominent in my identity as it is as it is for others um and certainly as an artist which i did do even before college um 
uh, that's that's certainly a big big piece of my my identity. Um, and as a family person in general, like uncle, nephew, son, all those all those titles, as a family person, um, I, I would put um, as a big part of my identity. But the the thing that I would add that I haven't talked about before is 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 the is the fact that I grew up in Harlem. Um, so I can just speak briefly to that as to you know when I when I was growing up it was the 80s and 90s and so you know it was not it was a it was the post white flight era where when cities were kind of being abandoned, um, and I remember we were I was young when we moved to to Harlem but I remember the move and my parents you know and it's probably shaped some of the some of my other answers too my parents sort of saw the inherent value in in the region um my mom had just completed an exhibition at the studio museum in harlem where she worked on the harlem renaissance 50 years before that um and uh you know the just the geographic i mean it's in the it's in manhattan you know city center um and because of her involvement in the studio museum in harlem i was aware of all the other world-class cultural institutions that existed in Harlem at that time. Was there a lot of violence? Absolutely. Then the, I remember the day we moved in, a woman's perch got, purse got snatched right on our block. Um, but I also remember a, bunch, a few guys chasing after that woman, tackling her and getting the purse, not chasing after the woman, chasing after the purse snatcher and tackling him and then and returning the purse to the, to the woman. Um, and that, you know, that sort of dissonance between, you know, the social ills that were affecting our community, but the real sort of value system and, and anchors that existed in our, in our um, neighborhood, um, I think shaped who I, who I was as, as uh, in my formative years, that yes, there are problems, we have to confront them, many of them not out of our control, however, if we stand true to our values and we stand true to the institutions that hold us um, that that hold us accountable and support us, um, you know, I have friends that traveled the world through some of these cultural institutions who were just kids in the hood, you know. Um, and so, I always saw, um, you know, the tremendous undervalue um, or underestimation of the value of 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 Black and brown folks, um, and that was largely shaped by my my time in Harlem, my formative years in Harlem. That's awesome! What a beautiful depiction! And Plus, like, we got style, baby. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody got more style than Harlem. This is true. This is true. Absolutely true. You know, um, I've seen you in like this really cool coat with the hat and it just reminded me of like the 30s zoot suit but like with the <laughs> with the two th twist to it I was like look at Seiko go ahead <laughs> was, well my awesome. dad is my style I, he's my style um uh icon he's he he nice. his his trademark is bow tie suspenders and a hat so I got the hat and I got the and he does wear you know very similar kinds of suits so I got the hat and that kind mm -hmm. of suit. And then I was like, I can't do the both sides. It just doesn't look good on me. Um, but I do wear suspenders pretty frequently too. So I, a lot, I borrow a lot from him. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> that is really awesome. Excellent. Now he grew Excellent. up in Philadelphia, but he, if you ask him, mm -hmm. he'll say he's a Harlemite too. <laughs> he was, and my, my grandmother lived in Harlem when he was very young and then they moved to Philadelphia. Got it, got it. Well, that's really interesting too because it's my um, my uh, uh, theory. I've been like doing a little social experiment. So usually, people if they were born in Philly, they will say, "Oh, I'm Philly. I'm from Philly," you know, right. or they grew up right. in Philly or something else. Like Philly is like the anchor, um, right. and the uh, the other anchor I've seen um, uh, is Harlem. You know. Mm -hmm. um, like everything else, you know, you could have lived somewhere else for 50 years, but you know, I'm from Harlem, <laughs> you right. know, uh, which is right. There are a couple places in the South have that too, but it also depends on 
how people, the people's relationships to that land or to that time period, will they talk about their Southern roots in the same way as, you know, like a Philly native will. That's right. also Philly natives don't leave. Um, but, you know, but, but that's a different story. So um, we're at our sixth question, which is, is there anything that I um, should have asked you that you wish I had asked you that I didn't or I should have asked you? Like, what, what did I miss? What did you miss? Um, well, you know, I, I, I talk a lot, so I don't think you've missed anything. Um, <laughs> let me see. What else, what else is there to say? Um, well, given what you said at the beginning, I think I, I, I read something recently that I think is, is worth repeating, which is, you know, oftentimes that what you seek is, is that what you need to do without. So the examples that he gave were, if you want to be wealthy, you got to be willing to be poor. If you want to be healthy, you got to be willing to kind of give up, you know, you got to be willing to be hungry, you know, those kinds of things. So there's a balance overall um, that no one ever figures out. But, you know, if your goal, I think for me, at a younger age, being more idealistic, you're less patient and less balanced. And I think the goal is to try to find the balance, right? And so no matter what it is that you desire out of your life, your career, your family, etc., cetera, um, understand that, you know, um, oh, the other good one was if you want to, you know, be in a healthy relationship, you have to be comfortable being alone, right? So there's there's this there's this balance. Um, not not to get all Star Wars on you, but there's a there is like a balance in the force, right? There's this there's this um, balance that I think I truly is particularly this year, right, when we're going through this kind of crazy times um, that I've really focused on and, and thought about. And I think you know to the extent that someone's watching this and looking for advice my big, biggest piece of advice would be always try to find that balance, whatever it is, whether, you know, um, you know, whether it's, you know, money and time or, or alone and together or, you know, um, or family and profession, like all of those things are things that we are constantly shifting and trying to figure out how do we, you know, make the most of, of both of those competing, often competing interests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Seiko. Sure. So, so that so that was that was it. Those are the six questions. And I'm so grateful that, that you spent this time and that we know you just a little bit better. Um, I am just immensely grateful that you are in our community community that you're in our lives that the passion that you have for your family your overall community i'm glad um and really grateful like how oddly we met <laughs> at that time in the um parking lot <laughs> holding the the mailbox <laughs> like you know, both of us like letters at 10 o'clock at night i don't know I'm just gonna... <laughs> Okay, I'm just gonna strike first. Let, let me just hold it open and that way I can see if it's nefarious, I can run, but if not, then you know, you never know. And then <laughs> you know, and who knew that that from that, um, and knowing each other's names prior to this, like I knew your name, but I didn't know your face. You know, right. I knew your work, you know right. who was behind the work, and it just became even sweeter when I saw um the face behind the work that I admired so much. Um and, and was cheering on um, and awarding, which is, which is really great. And I just really appreciate just your, your ability to um, combine all of these different things. And it makes sense to me that your concentric circles are in fact concentric, because I can see very clearly the alignment within um, that you're living within. And so that's really wonderful. And I just wanna thank you and honor you, my king, um, for all that you do and just to continue to do all that you do. And for real, thank your parents. So they did a good job. Yeah. <laughs> I will. Thank, thank you, Queen. <laughs> you're, you're amazing. You know, I think you're the best. Um, um, you are one of those folks who are building and are a pillar and anchor in our, in our community as well. So gotta, gotta give you the big you. shout out because you're doing yeoman's work for real.
Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And thank you for joining us for yet another King Crush Thursday. Um, I hope that you'll stay with us for next week for on a Thursday for yet another King, um, an interview with another King. And if you know a King that you want to celebrate and highlight in this forum, please um, DM me in my, my inbox or click the link in my bio or below and we'll take it from there. And in the meantime, please remember to spread love and have a great day. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you. That was fun.